All right, so let's start off with a word of prayer. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for uh, this day. Um, thank you, God, that you always provide for us. You're our counselor, and you grace us, and you love us. We thank you for this day. Coming to a close, we ask for your blessing as we talk about our lesson tonight. May you be our teacher. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Okay, we are going to start with a quiz. Yippee! We're going to start with a quiz here. Turn this on. Okay. Um, oh, I have a little featurette for you tonight about archaeology. And um, this is the definition of archaeology. And it says, the study of human history and prehistory through the excavation of sites and the analysis of artifacts and other physical remains. That's what archaeology is. Um, I've always wanted to go on an archaeological dig. Anybody here want to do that? Okay, so let me ask you a question. Who is the most famous archaeologist? Does anybody know that answer? The most famous archaeologist? Everybody knows. You're right. It's Indiana Jones. <laughs> 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 no, he wasn't, but he's the most famous archaeologist. Everybody knows Indiana Jones is. <laughs> okay, so um, here's a, 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 you can actually subscribe to this magazine. It's been around for years and years. Good articles about the digs that they're doing and the things they did discover in Jericho's Wall, et cetera, et cetera. There's a couple of young ladies on an archaeological dig. And um, time again, archaeology confirms what the Bible says. In fact, there's a Bible that I bought. It came out of, I don't know, I don't think even, well, maybe around 10 years ago. And it's called the Archaeological Bible. And it's about this thick, the New International Version. And the Bible, that Bible specializes, and if you want to see it later, I have it in the office, it specializes on archaeology. And it has, it's loaded with, it's a beautiful Bible color, and it's loaded with information about archaeology and how it backs up a lot of these stories in the Bible. It's really, really good. It's very good. Okay? All right. Scholars once questioned uh, the existence of King, there it is, once questioned the existence of King Sargon of Assyria, knowing nothing of him except for Isaiah chapter 20, verse 1. Who is this guy? And then uh, there's this 19-foot-tall thing from the Neo-Assyrian period, from the reign of King Sargon II, and there's the years, the 700s BC. It's in uh, Iraq, and it was excavated in 1928 and 1921. So before those dates, you know, the higher criticism biblical scholars were, ah, you see, the Bible is just a bunch of stories and myths, until this thing came along. And then I really like this one because this has to do with Daniel. It's the, the clay cylinder of King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. This is all in cuneiform. This is the writings called cuneiform. It just looks like a bunch of sticks. Like, it's just a lot of sticks. So they use a lot of symbolism. And the three columns of cuneiform, you see the three columns there, um, mention the building and reconstruction of various shrines, gates, and processional boats by King Nebuchadnezzar II. That's the guy in the Bible. Uh, it doesn't say never can have the second, but it is the second uh, for the Babylonian uh, Babylonian New Year festival, and it's at the uh, British Museum. So if you go to the British Museum, go and look this up. And if I remember correctly, I should have put the measurements, but if I remember correctly, it's something like around this big. I think it's about two feet or eighteen inches or two feet, something like that. You know, and in those days, they wrote on clay tablets and cylinders and and you know, granite rock, etc. Um, that's how they kept uh, things recorded. So um, it's very, very interesting. And in, in the Royal Ontario Museum, on a Babylonian clay cylinder, are written these words by Nebuchadnezzar: "Let the learned read again and again all my deeds, which I have written in my inscription, and let him ever give thought to the praise I deserve from the gods." Now this is really fascinating. Because we're going to go over Daniel chapter 4, the next lesson. Today we're doing Daniel chapter, uh, no, in the two lessons. Um, but in Daniel 4, what this says here in Daniel 4, you're going to read about his boasting and, in, and his pride. Well, this 
archaeological artifact backs up what the Bible is saying about his attitude and his self-exaltation in, in Daniel chapter 4. Very, very interesting. So, okay, so all of you have a quiz card? Daniel, make sure everybody has a quiz card. Okay, and uh, so let's take a quiz. In fact, let me bring this a little bit over here. Okay. So you got these cool new quiz cards instead of those envelopes. All right, let's take our quiz. It's a true and false. Ready? Here we go. Number one, and just write T or F in your blank line. We'll go over these again. The two issues over which controversy arises in the book of Daniel are the issues of worship and obedience. Mark your answer if that is a true or a false statement, okay? Those two issues. Number two, all the children of Israel refused to eat the king's food and drink his wine. All the children of Israel refused to eat the king's food and drink his wine. Question number three, the reason Daniel would not eat the king's food and drink his wine was that he was superior than everyone else. He was superior than everyone else. Is that true or false? Question number four, as a result of their loyalty to God, Daniel and his friends did 10 times better than anyone else in the university. They did better than anyone else. And then the last question, yeah, last night I think I had seven, didn't I? So there's not 10 tonight, there's just five. The only ones who passed the severe test in the whole book of Daniel were those who passed the small test in chapter one. For me, it's not a small test because when it comes to delicious tasting food, uh, I guess this wasn't, a, this wasn't a case of taste, <laughs> although I'm sure the stuff of the king's table was, tasted good. But uh, those are hard tests sometimes. All right, let's go back and review, see the answers. The two issues over which controversy arises in the book of Daniel are the issues of worship and obedience. What say ye? True. That answer is true, okay? That is, a, it's a vein that goes throughout the entire book. It really does. Number two, all the children of Israel refuse to eat the king's food and drink his wine. What do you think? That is false. Why do you say it's false? Well, it wasn't everyone. It wasn't everyone. There was a lot of others there. There was a lot of theirs. There were thousands of Jews that were, you know, taken and deported to Babylon. There was a lot of them. And um, as far as what we know in the Bible, there was only a few. And we have their names. The reason Daniel would not eat the king's food and drink his wine was that he was superior than everyone else. What do you think? Yeah, it's, that's false. He wasn't superior. Um, now, that's sort of a misnomer because he didn't think himself superior than everybody else. He didn't have that attitude. And that's sort of what I, I read in this question, his attitude. He wasn't like, you know, like this. But as a matter of fact, he was superior than everybody else. Because God blessed him and gave him knowledge and wisdom in the Chaldean culture and education, etc. Number four, as a result of their loyalty to God, Daniel and his friends did ten times better than anyone else in the university. True or false? That's absolutely true. That's what the Bible says. It says it very clear. The only ones who passed the severe test in the whole book of Daniel were those who passed the small test in Daniel chapter 1. What do you think? Sounds like a trick question? Yeah. Okay, so I mentioned this last night that there's a principle that behooves us to remember. If we do not pass the small daily tests that tend to be hidden from everybody else, then when the big ones come, more likely than not, chances are we're not going to pass those big ones. Which is why, so the answer is true, which is why um, the closer we get to God 
and the higher we become spiritually and mentally, physically, and the higher we become, there's an old saying, nobody tries to shoot down pigeons, they try and shoot eagles down. Who cares about the pigeons? They're common, they're average, they're all over the place. But you get an eagle or something awesome, those are the ones that people want. It same holds true in the spiritual realm. The higher you progress and develop in the image of God, those temptations are correspondingly going to become harsher. And you'll experience new ones that you didn't when you were average. Don't try and be average. And so we need to pass these small daily tests if we think we're going to be able to stand up in tough crisis ahead. As we looked at in our previous seminar, Final Empire, and where the United States, we believe, is, is headed. It's gonna, be, it's gonna be rough. Okay, so here's today's lesson. Conflict through the uh, centuries. Just uh, some, a little bit of stuff before we go into the actual lesson. Preterist, um, I went over this uh, a few nights ago. So a preterist means that, uh, remember, it's that school of interpretation. It's the filters you use to interpret apocalyptic prophecy. Preterist means that most of the prophecies, there's a little bit of overlap, but most of them uh, were fulfilled in the past. Futurist believes that everything, mostly everything is going to be fulfilled in the still yet future in a literal seven year period, okay? And then a historicist, sometimes it's called outline prophecy, starts with the time of the prophet, in this case Daniel, and then it flows through history until the time of the end. The book of Daniel is a book that is really the specialty is things that happen in the time of the end. In Daniel's current situation, but in the time of the end. Okay, and then also um, uh, repetition is God's method of teaching. Each prophecy adds more information. Uh, this is called repetition and uh, magnification, you can think of it that way. Uh, repetitive, huh? It repeats and it, it enlarges on something that was previous, okay? So Daniel 2 gives us a broad outline. So we're going to look at today of human history from Daniel's day to our day. <coughs> Daniel 7 covers that same period as chapter 2, but with different symbols and elaborates on a certain period in the time of the end. Okay, that's what Daniel 7 does. Daniel's eight, Daniel chapters 8 and 9 covered the same ground, but it adds more detail, adds more information for us. And so it's expounding. By the way, um, as I said in the previous night, Daniel 2, um, Daniel was, my guess is he was roughly 19, 20 years old. When, he was, when, when Nebuchadnezzar had the dream of Daniel chapter 2, and, and then God gave Daniel that same dream in order to tell Nebuchadnezzar what it was about and what it meant. That's Daniel 2. In Daniel chapter 7, Daniel is in his 50s, where he gets his own vision in Daniel 7. Which means that Daniel, God didn't give Daniel no vision for a few decades a few decades, and then Daniel chapter 8, um, Daniel 8 comes a couple of years after 7, and then Daniel 9 comes 12 years after Daniel 8. And Daniel 9 answers Daniel 8. There's part of the vision of Daniel 8 that he is just confounded, he doesn't understand. 12 years later, the angel comes to give Daniel the meaning of part of the vision of Daniel 8. So this is interesting. So why am I saying this? Because God is giving Daniel slowly and little by little more information as time passes. If I were Daniel, I would have said, God, when are you going to give me the answer? It's been 10 years since I've had the vision for us of Daniel 8. It's been 10 years and I still don't know. Uh, I would have been impatient. But Daniel just went on his business. And in Daniel chapters 10 through 12, it's one single vision. Chapter 10 is like an introduction. It's a lot of introductory material. And then you get to the nitty gritty in chapter 11. 
Oof, it's hard. But that likewise covers the same ground and further expands on our understanding of the end time. And so, remember what Amos chapter 3 verse 7 says, God will do nothing except he reveals his secrets to his servants, the prophets. So God is good. He reveals this information. There's a verse that I can think of in Psalms that says we need to be patient with the Lord. Because God, apparently, in Daniel's case, he's giving this information slowly, little by little, as God deems fit for Daniel's circumstances. Meanwhile, Daniel is being the witness in the pagan nation, a good witness. Okay, so here's just a summary. Daniel 2 gives us a broad outline of human history. 7 covers the same period as Daniel chapter 2, but with more symbols, different symbols. Daniel 8 and 9 covers the same ground, but more details. Daniel 10 and 12, same ground, and even expands it further. Okay, so how many of you read Daniel chapter 2? You can raise or not raise your hands in your minds. <laughs> okay, so... If you open your lesson there on page two at the very top, there's two points to remember, um, which is, I think I just went through this, right? I didn't review this part of my lesson. Um, yes, we went, over, we went over this already. Okay, Daniel chapter one. What happened to Nebuchadnezzar one evening? What happened to Nebuchadnezzar? Well, the answer says that Nebuchadnezzar dreamed dreams. He had dreams. Any of you have dreams? Oh, I have dreams all the time. And they don't make sense. <laughs> just, once in a great while in my ministry, I've had people come to me, once in a great while, it doesn't happen often, Pastor, I had this dream and I'm bothered by it. And You know, can you help me? I, I wonder if it means something. And they'll, they'll tell me the dream. And I tell them usually the same thing. I'm not a dream interpreter. I don't know. But unless you feel God is leading to do something that is right and righteous and justice, and if you're getting that message in the dream and it's a good thing, then do it. <laughs> right? Okay, question number two. What request did Nebuchadnezzar make of his wise men the next morning? The poor guy couldn't sleep. It wasn't a dream. It was a nightmare. That's what we would call a nightmare, right? So what request did he make? The answer is to show the king his dreams. These Babylonian wise men professed to be interpreters of dreams, and so the king was not making an unusual request. It was, it was just regular. Um, and it was something they were accustomed to doing. Tell us your dream and we'll interpret it. You know, their potion and their, their dice and their tarot cards and the Ouija board. I mean, they consulted all of these things, right? to figure it out, the stars and bones or whatever they did. Um, but what was different about the king's request to interpret the dream this time? What was different? What did you guys write? He didn't remember it. He says, the thing is gone from me. You ever have a dream and you don't remember what it was, but you're bothered by it? I'm like, what was it? Oh, man, that was, ah, and you just, you wish you could remember. Has it ever happened to you? It happens to me. Especially if you eat just before going to bed, <laughs> which we shouldn't do, um, because then you're not getting your, your, the rest that you need, and, you know, etc. So don't eat pizza just before going to bed. The thing is gone from me, so he couldn't remember the dream. Question number four says, were the Babylonian wise men able to interpret the dream? Nope, of course not. They were totally discredited. In this case, um, they were unable, first of all, they were unable to reveal the king's dream. And if the king could have recalled the dream, they could have devised some interpretation. They professed to have supernatural power, but when they could not reveal the dream to the king, they showed clearly that they had no supernatural power at all. You know, tell me the dream. But king, well, tell us the dream, we'll interpret it for you. And they kind of were arguing back and forth, and the king says... You guys are just trying to buy time. Tell me what I dreamt or I'm going to kill you. <laughs> and they couldn't. So, number, f oh, here's a fact here. It is not the wise men of the world from which we get spiritual advice. God here is discrediting those wise men. Can I say something real? I'm going to interject something here. The other day I saw a commercial a few weeks ago. And um, I was eating or something at home. And I wasn't paying attention to TV. And I saw it. And I, oh, I wonder what that's about. Counseling. 
A lot of times, what that's about? Oh my goodness, and I figured it was about psychics. You ever seen these commercials about psychics? They're nice commercials. They're not like with all painted green with big noses like the Wicked Witch of the West. <laughs> Let me read your future. You know, it's normal people and they're so happy and oh, I'm so glad I called, you know, you know Latifa because she told me everything and now it came true and uh, I have romance back in my life, <laughs> you know, wherever. Um, these wise men in our modern times are equivalent to the psychics, the horoscopes, um, crystal balls, the new age stuff. Um, we, we do not consult those types of things if we believe in God. So God is discrediting uh, the wise men and uh, they can't tell the king his dream, right? And somehow I skipped over something, didn't I? God is discrediting the wise men. Okay. They cannot interpret the dream. Oh, in Daniel 4, they can't interpret the dream even when the king tells the dream. He goes straight to Daniel. We'll go over that. Daniel 5, the wise men cannot read the mysterious handwriting on the wall. Um, it's just all over. And here's what 1 Corinthians says, We speak not in the words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Ghost or Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But, let, but the natural man cannot receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are what? Foolishness to him. Neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. And that's the thing. From the Bible's point of view, spiritual things are spiritually discerned for the Christian. And this is where the Bible comes in. So number five, in his wrath, what was Nebuchadnezzar's command concerning all of the wise men of Babylon? What was his command? That's right, to destroy all of them, just to kill all of them. They were all in one basket. You know, I don't know if all the wise men were there. Daniel and his friends were considered of the wise men of that group. So obviously they were not all there. She's so going to destroy them. Okay, let's look at Daniel's response in uh, question, when did, this is off. Okay, so this should say question six. When Daniel learned about the death decree, what request did he make of the king? That is question number six. Sorry about that. He asked for time. Yeah. If I kill you, if I say I'm going to kill you in an hour, you know, for some reason I'm thinking of the Wizard of Oz. Remember the Wizard of Oz? The Wicked Witch has Dorothy in her castle and she has this big hourglass and turns it upside down. And went, ah, ha, ha, ha. Oh, help! <laughs> you know, and the lion and the tin man and the scarecrow are trying to save her. And I remember seeing that as a kid and I was like, that was the scariest it movie was. for me. <laughs> it was scary. <laughs> But obviously, like Vernon said, they're going to ask for more time. They all wanted more time. I don't want to die. But that's what Daniel asked. Question number seven, having been granted his request, what did Daniel... Oh, so you got the answer, right? That he would give him time and that he would show the king the interpretation. Um, all of us are Christians here, right? We believe in God. Do you have enough confidence in God to say this? I mean, if there's the king and he's, and he's, uh, it's a death decree not to tell him what the dream means or what the dream is and what it means. It means death if you don't do it. Yeah, we, but, but would we have the confidence even before we pray, before the next day, before God gives, would we have the confidence to tell the king, give me time and I'll show you the interpretation. Because, in, because Daniel, what is not written here is Daniel believes that God can help him in this case. And obviously he's thinking, God, you know everything. You can show me what the king dreamt of what it means. Would we have confidence to go out on the plank and say this? <laughs> me too. <laughs> me too. This is confidence in God. My goodness. Wow. About dying to self. Number seven, having been granted his request, what did Daniel do? Now notice, notice the previous question. Daniel didn't need to pray first 
because he did pray, but he didn't pray first, God, give me the confidence to tell the king this. You notice? No, he first told the king, give me time and I will show the interpretation. That is trust. And then he goes and prays, having been granted his request, what did Daniel do? And this is the scripture, made the thing known to Hananiah, Daniel made the thing known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, that they would desire mercies of the God of heaven concerning the secret. Daniel and his friends went to the one source they knew that had the answer to the king's dream. So God gives wisdom, not mere academic learning. Uh, there's a lot of people that have lots of brains, but they're not so smart, right? There's a lot of people that have academic learning, but they're not so wise. Academic learning is good. Education is good. We wouldn't tell our kids, no, we don't want you to learn stuff. No, we should. But it is God that gives wisdom and understanding. That's God doing that. So when, uh, when did God reveal the dream to Daniel? What did you put for the answer? At night. The night vision, because Daniel's too busy during the day. God knows he has his business to carry on, and so he gives him the dream at night after that prayer season. All right, so question nine is quite involved. Question nine says, as Daniel blessed, blessed and praised God for revealing the dream to him, he enumerated seven things the dream tells about the God of heaven. Seven things about God. Okay, and you have it there, A through G. So let's look at it, okay? Letter A, referring to God, he changes the times and the seasons. This is all in Daniel 2, verses 21 and 22. This is God, Daniel talking about God. He changes the times and the seasons. Letter B, he removeth kings and setteth up kings. Because he saw this in the vision. And God interpreted it to him. Interestingly enough, um, the Bible summarizes things because, it, and it, it's, uh, well, I'll, I won't go there. Um, so Daniel says, he removeth kings and setteth up kings. Right? That's God. Letter C, he giveth wisdom unto the wise. Wisdom unto the wise. That sounds kind of funny. It's like saying giving an Olympic gold medal to those who win the Olympic gold medal. It sounds kind of funny, right? It gives wisdom to the wise. Um, I, I, I hear the, that scripture saying he gives wisdom to those who fear God, who are humble enough to fear God, because the Bible teaches that the fear of God is the what? Fear. Beginning of wisdom. The fear of God. It's not being afraid and like you're traumatized because God spanks you and abuses you. That's not that kind of fear. But it's a, a wholesome, healthy reverence uh, and uh, for God, a reverence for Him. And that takes humility, respect. That's what it means. Yeah, that's what it means. And so God gives wisdom unto the wise, those who are humble enough to say, God, you're all, you're everything, and I need you. Letter D, he gives knowledge to them that know understanding. Knowledge to them that know understanding. Fear of God is beginning of wisdom, humility. And then letter E, he revealeth the deep and secret things. He reveals the deep and secret things, things that we naturally do not know, right? Letter F, he knoweth what is in the darkness. He knows what is in the darkness. What does that mean? Things we can't see. No. Things we can't see. Um, we're, we're finite. We can't perceive and see and understand everything. There's certain mysteries and things we just, we just can't uh, understand. And God can reveal those things. And then letter G, um, the light dwelleth with him. Light dwells with God. In God there is no darkness. Even John in the New Testament teaches that. First John. Yeah. But in this case, the light, um, this not only 
refers to, I mean, physical light, obviously. But it's also metaphorical. In God, there is no stain of imperfection. He's, he's pure, okay? So that's what Daniel is. So God is in control of human events. This is the essence of what the prophecy of Daniel 2 reveals. God's in control of the events of human history. The rise and fall of empires appear as if happening by the will of men. But Daniel 2 reveals to us very clearly that God is behind all events. Nothing happens that God is not already aware of and has not allowed. Okay? Um, and this fact can raise some questions as to God's judgment as to why he would allow on or directly cause certain things to happen. Um, you know, but there's things, again, there's things that we're not going to understand. Um, you know, even I, all when I think of he is in control, again, like a note, he's not controlling, but he is in control. Then I ask myself some questions, which naturally comes up in my mind. Well, what about the Pol Pots of history, the Idi Amin's of history, um, the Hitler's, the Stalin's? You know, you, you ask those questions, and sometimes you come up against the wall, you know, you may not have, you may not come with satisfactory answers on your own, but the fact is this is what the Bible teaches, okay? Question number 10, what request did Daniel make of Arioch? What request did he make of Arioch? What did you guys write in your answer? Well, well, he did time, but there was something else. According to Daniel 2, verses 24 and 25, Daniel said, don't kill them, stop, <laughs> don't kill them, destroy them not. You know, I don't know about Daniel, if I were Daniel, I would have said, this is the perfect opportunity to get rid of those pagan sorcerers and witches and Ouija board readers, this is the perfect time, thank you God. <laughs> no, that's not what Daniel did. <laughs> which is revealing of Daniel's character. He knows that they are actively, proactively teaching error. He knows it. He knows that it is satanic, occultish things that the Babylonian wise men are teaching. And yet Daniel doesn't pray, God, destroy him. Thank you. I'll be the only one left because I'm the one that interpreted the dream. I'll back up my three buddies. And everybody else is gone, and we'll be able to teach truth in the kingdom. And yes, truth will go forward and conquer. It's not what Daniel did. Don't kill him. He's merciful. They've got families. They've got kids and wives. You know, they're human beings. And Daniel is intervening for these people. He's intervening for them. Isn't that cool? It's the kind of man Daniel is. Destroy them not. The astrologers, the magicians, all these fortune tellers. Question number 11. To whom does Daniel give the credit for being able to interpret the dream to Nebuchadnezzar? To whom does he give credit? Yep. The Bible says the God of heaven. None of the other wise men could reveal the dream, only Daniel. Yet Daniel doesn't claim superior intellect or wisdom. In fact, he said that. I'm nobody king. I don't have anything special about me, but there is a God of heaven. You know, he clearly gives all the credit to, to, to him and because Daniel is humble. Uh, just, he's humble. All right, so let's look at the dream and the interpretation. What did Daniel say the king saw in his dream? He saw, he saw, <laughs> he saw a statue. Okay, a great image or a statue. Okay, here's one artist's rendition of, of the statue with a rock coming and coming to destroy it. But this is what he saw, a statue. Anybody ever dream of statues before? No? Neither have I. <laughs> List the various elements that make up the image. So this is going to give you a clue. I called it the metal man the other day. All right, so did you write in your answers? All right, here we go. Here we go. The head is made of gold. The head is made of gold. Okay, there it is. The chest and arms of what? Of silver. Mm -hmm. What about the midsection? Bronze. Uh huh. Some versions say brass, brass bronze. And then the legs of iron. And then what about the feet and the toes? 
Yep, it's a mixture of iron and clay. I never tried to mix iron and clay, but the uh, Bible says it's, uh, unless it's a different clay back then and today we have technology and they can mix, I don't know. But at least back then, clay and iron just, just didn't mix, right? So there's the statue. That's what the king dreamt and what was worrying him. I think, dream, man, I thought you were going to see a, an ugly, ferocious beast eating you alive. Why did this thing scare you? But apparently, God impressed the king with the importance of this dream. It really meant something huge. And the king was impressed on this. And uh, so he forgot the dream, of course. And then so when Daniel is talking to the king, you dreamed of a big statue and the head was made of gold. How do you think the king is reacting as Daniel is describing the dream? Like, oh, that's it, that's, that's it, that's it. And I'm just, he's at the edge of a seat and just, I mean, how could he do this? And he's just, wow, this is amazing. So number 14, what did the stone cut out without hands do to the image? According to Daniel 2.34, it smashed it, yep. It hit the image, smote the image, and broke it to pieces, okay? Broke it to pieces. So this, man, this has got to be significant of something. I'm sure the king was telling himself when he couldn't remember. And then that same stone, when it struck the statue, what did it become? A mountain. It says here, Thou sawest till that a stone was cut without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay, and break them to pieces, and the wind carried them away, that no place was found for them. Absolutely nothing was left behind. And then, of course, that stone became a huge mountain and filled the whole earth, is what the Bible says. Filled the entire earth. Okay? So that meant something. I mean, you just, this means something to him. By the way, um, when I was in the seminary, um, I almost, I can't remember, I was, I needed one project to finish this class and, oh, time was short. So I went to my teacher, his name was Richard Davidson. In fact, he still teaches in the seminary. And, um, and he told me, well, well, what can we do? You need to get a project in. He says, why don't you research on this statue um, and research why... Uh, why did God give this particular imagery to the king in his dream? Why a stone? You know, why an image? Why a statue? But why a stone? And it becomes a why? How come God didn't like a chariot of horses? And this is not my professor said, but you know, why not a chariot of horses coming and destroying it? Or why not a one of these catapult rocks and destroys it? Why why a stone? And so he gave me that project. And uh, so I started studying pictures as, as far, I went to a book from the 1600s on what that statue, what artist's rendition of a statue, very different to now. Now we have the muscle man and that's not what the early artists painted him to be. And I started studying about the rock and what I discovered was really pleasantly surprising. That in the Babylonian culture and mindset, a, a mountain, a big rock and a mountain was significant and symbolized power and might. And, um, and so this was very, very significant to the king becoming a huge mountain and filling the whole earth. This is something like, wow, this is extreme power that is unsurpassed by anything else. And so I, that was an interesting discovery that I made. Okay, number 16, who now gives the interpretation of the dream to Nebuchadnezzar? Who gives it? Well, actually, the, Daniel does, um, but it's uh, Daniel and God together. And this is something also that you'll find throughout the entire Bible. Um, God is not just an observer just seeing things happen and he, he's not involved. Neither is God, as I said, a controlling God, um, a dictator God, and telling humans what to do, and he controls every single aspect of our lives. That may sound blasphemous. He's sovereign. It's a, he, is, he is sovereign, 
But there, if you read the Bible, um, for example, I'll give you an example. When Paul and uh, Silas, first Paul and Barnabas, no, Paul and Barnabas, and then Paul and Silas, when they went on their missionary journeys, you don't really read, this is in the book of Acts, you don't really read about God saying through His Spirit, go there. Now I want you to go to Lystra. Now I want you to go to Derby. Now I want you to go to Ephesus. You don't read that. You read how the Holy Spirit set Paul and Silas apart in Acts chapter 15. You set them apart and they take off for their second missionary journey. But you don't really read that God is saying, go there and go there. And there's other instances in the Bible where apparently God is working with humans and God allows us to make our choices according to the best of our knowledge. He guides us, but according to the best of our knowledge. Paul says, you know what, there's somebody over there. And then there are in some instances, and in the example I'm giving you in Paul's case, where God directly intervenes. One time God gave Paul a vision. And in the vision, Paul sees a man over Macedonia and saying, come over here and help us. So Paul packs his bags, heads for a ship, and sails off to Greece, to Macedonia. You know, there's things like that. So I want to say is in the Bible, there is a God-human connection working together. And God often gets frustrated. <laughs> and God often has to accommodate. Like we learned in the final empire. When the people asked Samuel for a king, do you think God said, no way, you're denying me, I'm not going to have none of this, go to bed, go to bed. It's not how God reacted. God said, all right, I'm warning you so it's going to happen, but okay, we'll have it your way. God accommodates even to things that he knows the people are going to mess up and fall flat on their face. Sometimes he'll do it because that's the only way we can learn. So God in us, it's like this. It's a relationship. And God is good and patient with us. And so the interpretation, God's interpreting, but he uses a human agent to do his work. God wants everybody to be saved, but guess who he gets, guess who he uses to preach to the unsaved. He uses the unsaved that become saved to preach to the saved, <laughs> the imperfect us. I mean, he's always working with us. And so Daniel and God both are in cahoots to interpret this dream for the king because they're partners. They have this covenant relationship with each other. Number 17. Now, here comes the meanings. What does the head of gold represent? Question number 17. It represents Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom. Babylon, okay? Notice that the prophecy begins with whose time? Daniel. Daniel. That's why I said in the first night, the historical approach to apocalyptic prophecy is this outline slash historical uh, perspective. Starts with Daniel's time, and then it moves along into the future. So that's what the head of gold represents. Number 18, question 18. There's good old Nebu. There's the Babylonian Empire. Uh, if you're not familiar with the Middle East, this is, the Mediter uh, this is Africa. Here's the Mediterranean, that's light colored. There's the boot of Italy. This is a Macedonian Greece area, the Aegean Sea. And here's um, Israel. And way over here was Babylon, around there someplace. Assyria was up here. So this was the Babylonian Empire, okay? All right. Um, so what was Nebuchadnezzar's, was Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom to last forever? Nope, it wasn't. Because Medo-Persia conquered Babylon. Succeeding kingdoms, I'm reading the note below question 18, succeeding kingdoms would be inferior to Babylon, but they would rule in their turn. Babylon would not last forever, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, let's move on. Question number 18. This is the writing on the wall of Daniel chapter 5, and they're all scared. This is a, um, oh, what's his name, Herodotus. Um, I have his book. 
Herodotus is a, what is he, Greek, Persian historian. He was a historian, and he wrote about the Persian Wars. And uh, he describes how Babylon was conquered. And what he says is uh, uh, the king of the Persians um, dug a canal and diverted the river. And of course, the Babylonians inside, this is Daniel chapter 5 says, the Babylonians inside were so secure. I mean, nobody could defeat Babylon, just nobody, no army. Um, and they were having, they are party harding inside, you know, while this was happening. Um, Herodotus, or Josephus, he's a Jewish historian, says that these walls were so thick that you could literally drive a four-horse chariot. That's not four horses tandem side by side, four horse chariot and make a U-turn on top of the wall. So that's probably, I don't know, <laughs> from me to Daniel over there, maybe farther. That's probably from this wall to where you are, Daniel. Maybe more. <laughs> I mean, just, that's a, the horses are big, so probably more. That's a thick wall. You, you couldn't defeat Babylon. It's a glorious empire. That's the way it was conquered. Okay, and then here's the Medes and the Persians. Um, look how extensive their kingdom is. They go way far out to the east, and then part of northern Africa here. Okay, that's the Medo-Persian Empire. So number 19, what metal would represent the kingdom that would follow Medo-Persia? And that's the third kingdom of brass, which is Greece. Okay, even the Medo-Persian kingdom would not last forever. Who was the first king of the Greeks? Alexander. Alexander the Great, the Macedonian. Alexander the Great uh, led the Greeks to conquer the Medes and the Persians in the Battle of Arbella in 331 BC. And the kingdom of Greece, the Brass Kingdom, came upon the scene. Question, there it is. There's the Greek Empire. He practically went to India. Uh, and he was just, you know, the top three generals of human history. Is, is, you know, that's me. And there's a picture of Alexander. I have to adjust this projector because there's a lot of contrast in these pictures here. Number 20, what metal represents the fourth kingdom that should come? What, me, what country? The, uh, the, uh, the legs of iron. Rome, okay. And there is the Roman Empire. Huge. Now, of course, they go out there in the west side all the way up to Britain. Now, uh, uh, Gran Britannia, Great Britain, uh, they did not like the Romans. <laughs> that was the northernmost part of their kingdom. But you have Spain and et cetera, and of course Italy, and you have Carthage up here. They conquered Carthage and all of the Carthaginians, Carthage, whatever you say, they were Rome's fierce enemies. Uh, oh yeah, they were, these guys were bad. But uh, that's an extensive kingdom, okay? So that's Rome. The kingdom that followed Greece was the Iron Monarchy of Rome, who ruled from 168 B.C. to A.D. 476. This is the kingdom that dominated the world when Jesus was born. When Jesus was born, during the Roman times. Okay? All right. And uh, there's a picture of the Colosseum in Rome, or what artists thought it might look like. And then, of course, we got the Caesars. Uh, they're just a very powerful nation. Very, very strong. Number 21, what would be the condition of Europe after the breakup of the Roman Empire, according to Daniel 2, verses 41 and 42? What's the condition? Uh, you got, yep, yeah, you got the, now here's, here's, this is the foot of clay and iron. And the Bible says the kingdom shall be divided, partly strong and partly weak, partly broken. And I'm reading the note here under question 21. As prophesied, when the Roman Empire ended in 40, AD 476, it was not taken over by another world kingdom. Instead, as the Bible foretold, barbarian tribes conquered the Roman Empire and divided it. Ten of these tribes eventually became modern Europe. They were the Ostrogoths, the Visigoths, Franks, Vandals, Suevi, Alemanni, Anglo-Saxons, Horelli, Lombards, and Burgundians. Um, in fact, that word Alemanni in German... In Spanish, you say Germany in Alemania. That's how you say Germany in Spanish, Alemania. And so, yeah, and there it is. So those are the Germans, the Anglo-Saxons is Britain, of course. 
Um, seven of them still exist today in Europe. For example, the Anglo-Saxons became the English, the Franks became the French, the Lombards became the Italians. Daniel 7 will tell the fascinating story of the power that destroyed three of these ten divisions. Okay, um, And there's, uh, on the map on the screen, there's Western Rome divided. And you see all of the European divisions. So the Western Roman Empire, um, what we're not going to go over here, but there was um, after in the later in the 500s, 600s, when the Roman Empire became the Holy yeah. Roman Empire, Catholicism, you have a split. Then you come way over here to, where am I? Then you come way over here to the east. Byzantine was here, which became Constantinople. So then you have an Eastern Roman Empire and a Western Roman Empire. And that was like that until the Western fell. But then over here, it fell in, I think it was in the 1100s, um, the Holy Roman Empire. Okay, so this is called outline prophecy. Now you notice how far it goes. Started with the time of Babylon. That's when Daniel is alive and well in Babylon. He's the one that's interpreting the, the dream to the king of Babylon. And then it goes through all these kingdoms, the Persians and the Greeks and the Romans, and all the way over here to the end where there's countries that are divided. Um, you know, the European Union has been around for a while uh, where they all share, let me go back to this map here, where uh, the European Union share one currency. Um, you know, the, the big decision making is done in, I think, in Brussels, if I'm not mistaken. And just recently, guess what happened? Uh, England officially voted, where am I? Uh, England officially voted to exit the European Union. Really? Yeah, it's official now. So some people are wondering, ooh, what's going to happen? And my son says, I know that I, whenever I think about it, it's weird. But I remember telling my son when we were a kid, uh, when he was a kid, yeah, Germany used to be East and Western Germany. I remember saying, what? East and West Germany? I said, yeah, the East Germany was a communist and West Germany and there was that wall, et cetera. And, and then he says, dad, it's just weird how thinking that Russia, you know, was a threat to the United States and the Cold War and it was the USSR. And I said, yep, <laughs> you know, so there can be apparent unity for a while. Um, but as far as one empire, we don't have that today. Even the European Union, they all have their own individual governments. But anyways, that is outline prophecy. Okay, so there you have it. Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, Europe divided. Number 22 says, would these 10 kingdoms ever seek to unite? What do you think? Yeah. Of course they would. So that's the history. There's a little chart of the intermarriages that uh, take place. You can't see it, but... They shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. Through marriage, alliances, and other means, men would attempt to unite the European continent once again. This has just been the history of Europe, trying to do that. Hitler, the Third Reich, you know, um, you know we're going to reign for a thousand years. And they tried it, and it didn't work. Now, I wonder if I have something on here. Um, I, I may. We'll see if I, if I do have it. Number 23, will the European continent ever be united again? Yeah, Great Britain pulled out. They pulled out. They shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. That's the symbolism of the unmixable iron and clay. It's just not going to be able to cleave together like it used to be during the Babylonian Empire and these world empires. Now, of course, this is just a little important tidbit of information. The Bible is only concerned with a Mediterranean world. Some people have asked, well, what about North America? What about China? How come the Bible doesn't say anything like that? Well, that's because um, nobody knows where the Garden of Eden is. Some postulate that it was probably in the Iraqi, modern Iraq area. Abraham came from Mesopotamia of Ur in that area. And so God calling people and choosing a people as his very own, etc. It was all centered there in the Mediterranean world. And Israel is the perfect spot. If you look at the map, it's between the big African continent 
and then up to Asia Minor, and it's, so it's a perfect, and then of course the east towards Babylon, Assyria, and up north in Tyre and Damascus, it's the perfect situation for trading routes. And so God purposefully chose that area, chooses people so that it can be disseminated, his truth and his ways and his laws and his love to all peoples. And so the Bible is concerned with the people that God had called in that part of the world. We don't know what was happening in China except for you know other books you'd have to read, but it's, it's concerned about the Mediterranean world. That's what the Bible is focusing on. Okay, and there's uh, some kings trying to uh, unite Europe. Who's that? Napoleon. And that may be Charlemagne, I don't know. Uh, I don't know who this guy is. Okay, so let me, uh, <laughs> I wish I would have brought this out here. I just thought about this. And my members have heard this story before. Um, back in the 1940s when Hitler was conquering and uh, just accessing nations to himself, etc., cetera, um, we have an Adventist publication called Signs of the Times. It's been around for years, for decades. And in the 1940s, there was a man by the name of Maxwell I think it was Mervyn Maxwell, or Graham Maxwell, one of them, not Graham Maxwell. There was these brothers, um, but one of the Maxwell brothers, a, uh, an author and a preacher and at, from the Adventist church, wanted to write an article for the Signs of the Time magazine uh, during Hitler's rising to power. And he wanted to write this article about Daniel chapter two and how Hitler would fail because of what the prophecy of Daniel chapter two says. And the editors encouraged him, don't go so hard on this. Don't, don't be so uh, dogmatic about this because look what's happening over here. Look what Hitler's doing. To, uh, to which Maxwell responded, but this is what the prophecy says. And so, you know, the article was published in Signs of the Times and I, I have a copy of it. And there's a picture of Hitler's army in the tanks and the article it all is about how Hitler will fail. It's a prediction that Hitler will not succeed when he was just conquering and nobody could stop him. And it was very, very interesting. Kind of like Daniel. Kind of like Daniel, when Maxwell was. Daniel said, Shh, give me some time and I'll tell you what the dream means tomorrow. <laughs> uh, Maxwell did the same thing. And the article was published and, of course, it was right. Right? Okay, let's look at the stone kingdom. Oh boy. Number 24. Who will set up the final kingdom according to verse 44? Who will set it up? The God of heaven. God himself. There's the rock, and here's Daniel explaining the dream to Nebuchadnezzar. Okay? The God of heaven will set it up. What will God do to the kingdoms of earth when he sets up his kingdom? What will God do to the kingdoms of the earth? What'd you write? The vision says that uh, it, they'll, they'll be broken in pieces and consume all these kingdoms. Okay? It'll consume all of those kingdoms. God will do this. God's kingdom will not be a takeover of earthly kingdoms. He will completely consume, destroy, and blow away all the kingdoms of the earth. The New Testament says that God will create a new heaven and a new earth, and God's kingdom will be everlasting. You know what Jesus one time said in the Sermon on the Mount? He says, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit heaven. What did he say? The earth. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Now, never have the meek inherited the earth in our time. Jesus is pointing forward to something. So this is our permanent stomping grounds when God makes the earth new. It's going to be amazing. It's going to be amazing. Yeah. Question number 26. Oops. 26 says, what is represented by the stone kingdom? What is represented by the stone kingdom? The kingdom of Christ or the kingdom of God. Okay. The kingdom of Christ. Um, this prophecy... So let me just add a little something here. What this prophecy, this particular portion of it, the stone and etc., is undermining 
rapture theology. Okay, this secret rapture. Because the statement says that the scriptures declare that when Jesus Christ returns to earth the second time, he will crush the kingdoms of earth and establish an everlasting kingdom which will have no end. That is diametrically opposed to rapture theology. Because um, rapture theology says that people will secretly and suddenly be wished away invisibly and therefore God's kingdom will be with these people. And then there's going to be seven years that are going to pass when the people are with him. That's not what this prophecy is saying. This prophecy is saying that the kingdoms of the earth will be destroyed. They'll last until the very end. They're going to last until the very end. Then Christ will destroy all of those kingdoms and he will set up his kingdom. And the, the, the vision says that the rock becomes a mountain on earth. Fill the whole earth. So really, uh, the secret rapture theology, um, there's a little more detail of that, but the secret rapture theology doesn't really quite fit into this vision. Okay. Um, and interestingly, the four kingdoms are world ruling in the Mediterranean world, affecting God's chosen, the Jews, and then Christians. I'm just reading my little note here. But, let me read my note. But there is no... A fifth world ruling kingdom, which means there is no longer a geopolitical power to have dominant rule over God's people until the little horn power of chapter 7 comes to rise to press God's people and Christians once again. Um, so we're going to go over that in Daniel chapter 7, this, this antichrist power. Okay, we're almost done. Question number 27. After hearing the interpretation of the dream... What did Nebuchadnezzar say about Daniel's God? He is the God. Your God is a God of gods and a Lord of kings. So having seen that God is in control of world events, even the heathen Nebuchadnezzar acknowledged that Daniel's God is above all the heathen gods of Babylon. Well, how could he not? Who else could tell the king what he was thinking? Who else could tell the king what, what he dreamt? Nobody, yeah. nobody, else, nobody else knew that. Okay, chap, uh, number 28. As a result of their faithfulness, how were Daniel and his friends promoted by Nebuchadnezzar? Well, uh, he's just, yeah, he, he gave him, you know, a billion dollars. Yeah. Right? The Bible says this. Daniel was made chief of the governors over all the wise men of Babylon. How would you like to be the boss of Governor Ducey? <laughs> You're his boss. And he comes to church, yes, sir. <laughs> or yes, ma'am. He tells you, yes, ma'am. <laughs> the king set Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the affairs of the province of Babylon. I could just hear it on the news, you know. Um, Foreigners placed over Babylonian locals in the government news at six. You know, I mean, you have these, and they're captives. And God places them as rulers. It's amazing. So recognizing that God is in full control of earthly events, are you willing to let him have full control of your life? Yes. yes. And this is, one of, this is why I was saying earlier, um, this chapter, it certainly is about God's sovereignty over the world. Um, God is the one that is orchestrating in his time and in his way where things, how things are going, where things are headed. Okay? Um, God is the master of the universe. He really is. But Daniel chapter 2, if you think about it, it should bolster confidence and trust in God. Because if God can know the future centuries and centuries and centuries in advance, in fact, millennia in advance, um, don't you think that God could take care of your tomorrow? Don't you think God will take care of you next week and provide for our needs if he already knows the future? And so 
we can personalize Daniel chapter 2 and make it personal and spiritual. Make it, own it, and recognize God's loving guidance in our lives today. So I want to invite you to always do that. Okay, let's look at some response questions. There's no boxes to mark, but if the principle of outline prophecy or historical prophecy, as illustrated in this lesson, is clear, put a check in box one, okay? ka <laughs> If it's clear. Um, number two, if it is your desire to be ready to meet Jesus when the stone kingdom smashes the image, then say, I do. <laughs> All right, so our next lesson is conflict over false, wor false worship. We'll pass these out in a minute. Does anybody have any questions to what we covered tonight? Anything at all or comments that will help feed me and others? Any of your comments? You know, I have yes, Diana. When you were talking about Hitler and that guy Maxwell, the right. article, right. I wish I could quote it. I wish I could say who it was, but there was a guy on Good News TV that was going from his grandfather's story that he, this Seventh-day Adventist yeah. evolved into a military situation. Right. You know yes, I do. Can you please tell him? Yeah, so Michael Hazel is the one that is telling this story. Michael Hazel is the son of Gerhard Hazel. Gerhard Hazel, who died in 94, was my seminary professor. Wow. In fact, he taught the book of Daniel. Yeah. Gerhard's father... I can't remember his name, was the one that uh, he is referring to. So uh, Michael Hazel, this younger, well, he's not, he's probably my age. His, he's talking about his grandfather, how he was in World War II, and he was a German soldier. He was one of an, an understudy, German soldier. And, uh, and so the Germans, well, in fact, there's a book published. Is there? Yeah, there's a book, A Thousand Shall Fall is the name of the book, A Thousand Shall Fall. My, my son loved that book, he ate it up. And I think it's in that book. And so um, Michael Hazel, as he tells the story, his grandpa was before a German soldier. And the German soldier uh, asked him, you know, because he knew that he was a Christian and he was a professor, this, his, the, his German superiors. He was asking him, you know, what he thought about all of this and whether he thought Hitler was going to win. And he was sort of reticent to answer. He says, well, sir, um, if I may answer, but uh, off the record, something to that effect. And so at that, the captain took off his hat and put it on the table. Now, in the German soldier culture back then, taking off the hat and put, sending it down meant this is off the record, you can speak freely. And so at that point, he took out his little Bible, this Adventist German soldier, and opened it up to the book of Daniel chapter 2 and started reading and gave his captain a Bible study on Daniel chapter 2 and how, and then he closed the book and he says, so therefore, sir, you know, I'm paraphrasing, um, it is impossible that Hitler is going to win this war. Um, and, um, and I don't remember how it transitioned into this next part of the story, but what the captain ordered, this is incredible. <laughs> and this captain wasn't, uh, you know, an Adventist by any means, but what he ordered, certain of the soldiers were in some place in Europe, um, or maybe there in Germany, and of course the Soviets were closing in on Germany, and so what he ordered was a lot of extra gasoline vehicles to be taken, and I think food rations, to be taken to his battalion, or his, probably a battalion or something, um, in order to escape. And so that's what they did for this particular battalion. The Soviets closed in, and every one of those soldiers was saved because they escaped because they're going to need a lot of gas to get hightail it out of there. I don't know if it was in Berlin or where it was, but it was all because of what this uh, uh, Seventh Adventist, I think he was a pastor before he had to become a soldier. It was all because of what he told him about Daniel Tune that Hitler was going to fail. And sure enough. <laughs> Now, I think Michael also tells a story we never, they never knew what had happened to that particular uh, German captain. But it's a true story. It's a true story. Fascinating. Very, very fascinating. Thank oh, you for mentioning that. Oh, my God. Yeah. I loved it. Yeah. yeah I, it's, I thought you were going to say it at first. Oh, okay. Yeah. It's a I great. Yeah. By that. Fantastic. All right. Anyone else? Okay. So why don't we have a word of prayer and then we'll ha hand out these lessons. 
Father in heaven, we thank you so much for Daniel chapter 2 and how it is an inspiration for us, God, to always trust you and to place any fears of the future and lay them down at your feet. Lord, we're imperfect. We may get nervous of our own country's future or the world and viruses and and all these things, God, but help us to be like Daniel and his friends where they trusted implicitly in you, confidently, and because you are the sovereign of this world and you're directing the affairs of, of humanity. And uh, we know how the story ends and we want to be on the winning side. Amen. So we thank you, God, for revealing this to a pagan king and to us in turn and help us, God, to follow your lead in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. All right, well, have a good night. Uh, Daniel, if I may ask you to pass these out for me. So this is Daniel 5. This is Daniel chapter 3. Oh, what a chapter. You're going to enjoy. So again, read chapter 3 of Daniel. When is our next meeting? Friday. Friday. Friday, Friday night at seven o'clock. And uh, so read. You have a you know you have a full a couple of days to read Daniel chapter three and read it a couple of times. And I would particularly draw your attention to chapter three and verses like 14, 15, 16, 17, 18 around there in that area. Particularly focus on that and see if you can come up with. Um, what message, carefully read those verses, what message can come across? What principles, what principles can you take out of that, those verses?